My name is Lee. I am the founder and CEO of Chatter High, and I'm based on the west coast of Canada. And at this age, a lot of teenagers probably don't care that much yet about, you know, the careers and exactly what they're going to be doing, because that still feels a long way off. Um, but there's some amazing research behind why we do this. And I want to explain this research to you and explain why this is such a valuable activity. But rather than just tell you all the research, I want to use and share my career path with you, which is really unique and interesting. And hopefully you can see how this all pieces together. While you guys are going through high school, you pick all these different courses. Some of you will have jobs. Some of you will have talked to your parents about their jobs. You might have listened to presenters, uh, visit the local colleges. You know, all of these different things expose you to different programs that you could study, different jobs that you can do. And you build something called vocational identity, which literally means how do I see myself in the world of work? And for me, this started really early. In second grade, I met a paleontologist. You know, I was in grade two, and this man tells me he's a dinosaur hunter, and I thought that was the coolest thing. And so uh, I told him I loved dinosaurs. And he actually mailed me a real dinosaur bone with paperwork. And when I got this, I was hooked. I wanted to be a paleontologist right through to the end of grade 12. Now, when I grew up, we had uh, grade 13. I grew up in Ontario in Canada. And, uh, but at the end of 12th grade, McGill University, which is one of the larger universities in Canada, in Montreal, recruited me to play quarterback for their football team. And they bring the recruits out to Montreal and the fourth years take us out in the town and they marched us through the empty stadium and they did all these fun things and I totally wanted to go to McGill University. But that's when I discovered that this 200 year old university that has 300 programs doesn't offer paleontology. And that totally surprised me because I assumed that the biggest universities have all of those sciences, you know, and they don't. You got to figure it out. And in fact, there's 2,600 programs you can pick from at college or university across North America. And the biggest ones only have about 300, which means these programs are spread out all over the place in different colleges and different corners of the country, you know. And back before the days of the internet, it took me a month of Sundays to figure out that the only place in Canada that offered paleontology was the University of Alberta in Edmonton. But I kid you guys not, the second week of September in my last year of high school, the University of Alberta announced that they'd cut their football program due to budget cuts. <laughs> and I took that piece of information, I heard that and I thought, oh my gosh, I don't want to apply to that university. Like I, it scared me off. Even though every course I'd picked in high school, I'd picked to be a paleontologist, I didn't apply. And it was the only place in Canada and I never thought once to look south of the border into America at Bowling Green University, you know, where I could also have studied paleontology. I just didn't apply. So now I had to figure out what to do. Well, paleontology is part of the life sciences, which includes archaeology, anthropology, geology, marine biology, all of those sorts of things, which I thought was all kind of interesting. So my new plan was I was going to apply to a number of different places for different programs. And wherever I get in, that will shortlist my options and figure it out from there. But there was actually one other major factor. My parents were immigrants. Uh, they came over from Holland after World War II. And like a lot of uh, immigrants back then, they left everything behind. Um, my parents met in Montreal. I was born in Toronto and my parents were poor. Um, and the first two years of my life, we lived in a renovated garage. And then we got into something called the Ontario Housing Program, which is essentially the rent for low income families. Um, my dad got a job at some point as a dishwasher, and then my mom got a job, and they took turns supporting each other as they started to go through school. And so, but by grade nine, they really didn't have any money. And they said, look, you keep talking about stuff that's at university. Just so you know, you will have to pay. We will not have the money. So I knew that I was going to need a job throughout high school, and I knew I would try and fight for scholarships. So just a couple of comments here uh, on jobs first. By the time you guys get into uh, your senior year, it would be clever if you've had at least three months experience working. Um, the reason for three months is that a lot of corporations and companies will have a 90 day probation period to assess whether you're good or not, good enough or not, right? And so if you're good enough, they'll keep you going after 90 days. And if not, they'll probably let you go. 
And the reason that that matters is um, for some of you, you will end up applying for competitive entry programs at college. And really those recruiters are gonna look at all those applications and try and guess which students are going to make it to second year. Because often the first year of college isn't about how smart you are, it's about how hard you work and how well you manage your time. And so if you've been able to keep a job down while you're in high school, guess what? You're sending them a signal that you can manage your time, you're responsible and so on. You probably know what scholarships are and you probably assume that the highest academic students and superstar athletes can get scholarships and there's lots of scholarships for those guys, for sure. But I want you to know that in America, there's $3 billion every year that nobody asks for. <laughs> $3 billion. There is a zombie apocalypse scholarship where you get $2,000 for sitting in a room for a few hours talking about zombies with other people. Now I'm guessing that that's some sort of video game company that put that one together, right? And that's the whole point is that companies and corporations will make up reasons to hand out money to you guys because it makes them look good and they like to help you, you know? And so, but there can be scholarships for all sorts of reasons. There was a scholarship up here just for being left-handed, a $1,500 scholarship. <laughs> and so you just have to go out and find them, right? And, you know, check out the bank websites and there's lots of resources, but you just need to start digging. But you can apply for many of those and stack it up. And that's what my mom made me do. She knew that that stuff existed. She made me do it. And I, I went out and applied for a whole bunch of stuff. But by the end, I actually scraped enough together to have my first year paid for at different universities. And so now I had a different problem, which was I got into a few of them and I was undecided. I didn't know where I wanted to go. So it's October, my last year of high school and I'm undecided. And I told this to my parents. So then my parents said, there's a bus going next week, a two hour drive from here to check out another university called RMC, which I'd never heard of RMC. So I said, mom, what's RMC? She goes, Royal Military College. Right? This is the Canadian equivalent of West Point, <laughs> it turns out. And so I said, uh, was I a bad child? You know, <laughs> like, do I not make my bed? Um, I thought that would be for like students that need discipline or something. And she said, no, no, no. It's the federal university in Canada. Just for getting accepted there, it's a $100,000 scholarship and the government will pay you a paycheck every two weeks to go there. So I thought, okay, I better check this out. So I got on a bus and we drove for two hours. And we pick up other students along the way. I don't know anybody. We get off the bus in the parking lot, guys. And within two minutes, I'm completely freaked out because this row of first year students comes marching out of a building somewhere and they come marching towards us and they all have short hair and white t-shirts and gray shorts. And they look really tired and really angry. At the closest point, this man in the middle of the row, he turns his head to the left and looks at us and he says, don't do it. <laughs> like what? Okay, McGill University is working really hard taking us out in the town to show off their place and these guys are telling us to run away. <laughs> that doesn't seem like a good plan. Anyways, but you got to go on the tour. So we go walking through all the faculties, which are the different buildings for each degree program, you know, and I'm listening to their stories. And I have to tell you that by the end of the day, I was completely enamored with the place, right? It was clearly hard, which is why the first years were crying. Um, it's all about teamwork. Everyone does sports for a couple hours a day. Um, they pay you to go there. So I thought, what have I got to lose? I wonder if there's something here that I would like to study. So I went home and I told my parents that I was intrigued. And so they take me downtown to this place, recruiting center, and Sergeant somebody is sitting there. And I said, hi, I'm Lee. I would like to be a paleontologist. And I'm wondering what programs you offer. And he looks at me and he says, son, we don't dig up dinosaurs in the military. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good point. He said, but it sounds like you like the life sciences, right? And I said, yes. And he said, well, we've got the only undergraduate degree program of its kind in Canada, which is a double major in oceanography and space science, which I thought sounded pretty cool. So I said, I will apply for that. So he gives me all that paperwork. Somewhere in there, it asked me to list my top three job choices in the military, which I thought was really strange because if the government is going to spend $100,000 to educate me to make me into an oceanographer. Wouldn't that be the work that I'm doing for the country? <laughs> um, so I thought I better not write tank driver, you know, or pilot, that didn't make any sense. So where would I do this work, you know, oceanography? And so my logic was oceanography, which is the study of the ocean, which is where the ships are, which is where the Navy is. You know, I better write down Navy. And I handed it in. Now here's the deal guys, that happened 30 years ago. 
I knew exactly what I was going to do with my life with laser focus. And yet everything that I've done in my life since the day I graduated high school, I did not know existed. And most of it didn't. I retired five years ago after 25 years in the command line for the Navy. I went through four years of military college and while I was there, I met the Queen of England. I've worked in the Arctic. I've sailed around the world twice and it is round just in case there's any confusion. <laughs> I've done two tours in the Persian Gulf. I have medals from the United Nations and NATO. I saved a man's life in the Indian Ocean. I wrote the 50 cal machine gun drills for our frigates. I wrote the anti-piracy policy for the Straits of Malacca. My profession was hunting submarines. How many of you guys have that on your list of things you'd like to go do when you grow up? Hunt submarines. <laughs> I didn't even think of a submarine once while I was in high school. When I was on the bridge of a warship, I was legally in charge of that ship, which is a pretty big deal when it's a billion dollar national asset with 250 souls on board and I had a helicopter in the back. <laughs> this is a silly story, but this is one of my favorite stories. So the Canadian Navy is the only Navy that can embed into an American battle group. So both of my deployments to the Middle East were in American battle groups. And uh, so it's two o'clock in the morning, we're sailing to Guam, we're crossing the Pacific we're the flank guard off the USS Constellation, which sails out of San Diego. We're the flank guard off her port quarter. And our job, along with the other 13 ships, is to surround the carrier and protect it. And there on my chart, as we sail across Marianas Trench, is Challenger Deep. I can actually see the spot, Challenger Deep, which is the deepest place on Earth. If Mount Everest was hiding in Challenger Deep, there'd still be like 3,000 feet of water above it. <laughs> and so here I am, a dorky oceanographer student, you know, this is the coolest thing. You're not supposed to leave your sector, but I did. Port 30, I turned the ship south, I sailed out of my sector, I sailed over Challenger Deep, ran out to the bridge wing with a camera and a nickel, you know, and took a selfie, which is what you do. But of course, back in 1999, it took me six months to develop the film before I could even look at that photo. <laughs> Times have changed. Uh, and I threw this nickel into the ocean and I sailed back into my sector thinking, nobody knows what I just did. Well, the captains of the ship know everything, even in their sleep. The next morning, the captain calls me to his cabin and this is what they do. He goes, Lee, why? <laughs> so open-ended questions are dangerous, right? But you gotta be accountable. So I said, sir, I wanted to throw a nickel into Challenger Deep. And he goes, why? <laughs> so then I break down on him. I'm like, sir, I got a Canadian nickel and I put it at the bottom of the earth and I think that's cool. And he goes, oh, just go. I'm like, get out of my cabin, you weirdo. <laughs> and the whole point of this guy is just to tell you that I could not have dreamed of the stuff that I've done. You know, even in 12th grade, knowing exactly what I was going to go do, Everything has turned out different for me. And I promise you guys, the same thing is going to happen to you. Now you may not end up hunting submarines, but your life is going to be different than you think. There's just no way around it. In Canada, you can work full-time in the military or part-time. And so I worked full-time for 10 years, and then I worked part-time for 15 years. And during that time, I had other normal full-time employment. The first job, the largest company in the world in the year 2000 was General Electric, GE. And they hired me to manage at a locomotive facility in Vancouver, British Columbia. And in the job interview, the man said, you have to have a master's degree in engineering for this job in mechanical or electrical engineering, which I didn't have. I had a double major in science. But then he said, or we accept your experience as an officer or senior NCM in the military because we think you guys can figure it out. <laughs> the largest company in the world was telling me, you know what was more important than this master's degree? The skill of being adaptable. Adaptability, guys. And I'm telling you right now, adaptability is the most critical competency you are developing as you go through school. I did that for five years. To get promoted, you had to move to Haver, Montana or Erie, Pennsylvania, and I was happy staying on the West Coast. So I said, okay, time to move. Um, and I, I ended up by luck meeting the CEO of 7-Eleven in Canada. And he was starting a company that was so new, the industry didn't even have a name. 
that industry is now known as digital out of home, which is basically where you control digital screens in public places over the internet. You guys will see it all around town, big billboards in the highway or in malls and stuff like you'll see video screens. You go into Wendy's or like fast food restaurants, the menus are electronic. You know, there's someone in Kentucky controlling 7,200 Wendy's menus from his phone. And so I built a network like this across Western Canada. And I found myself designing advertising at the airports and putting screens on highways, but basically my job became marketing, advertising, and sales. Now that got me working with the local colleges here in town who were trying to promote their programs on our screens so that students like you could find out what they offer. And I didn't think it was working that well. We couldn't get a teenager to look away from their phone long enough to stare at the screen. <laughs> so I had lunch with the director of marketing and recruiting at the college and I said, David, you guys have 160 programs at this college. Like that's a lot of programs. And I don't know if I could name 10 of them, but how does Billy the ninth grader figure out what you offer today? And he said, well, the direct methods to get information into the high schools includes sending printed material to their guidance offices, sending presenters around and getting booths at career fairs, which I thought like, what? That's what we did back in the eighties. And I don't think it worked that well back then, <laughs> right? So now I'm an entrepreneur and I've built a company to gamify looking at that information, which is Chatter Hive. I'm going to show you here shortly, but I'm the CEO of this company and I'm having to figure out how to do all this, you know, but I've got a great board of directors that, you know, mentor me. I've got a great team around me um, and I'm figuring it out. I've raised $4 million over the years, pitching to investors. Uh, we were named the ed tech of the year and we've grown from, you know, right across the country. And so we're figuring it out. Now, the whole point of telling you guys about this crazy career path of mine is that you can kind of go, wow, like there's a lot of differences here. You know, one thing doesn't necessarily lead to the next. Uh, and so I'm somebody that is clearly adaptable. Well, how does that happen to us? How do we become adaptable? So let's reflect on that for a moment. Has anything that I've done in my life for work look like digging up dinosaurs? Remember that? That's what I wanted to do all through high school. I took all the wrong courses in high school, guys. Like literally, if the point of high school was to pick courses you're actually gonna do in your life, I should have taken trades and business and marketing and entrepreneurship and coding. I should have taken drama or something like that because of all the public speaking I've had to do, you know? I took all the wrong courses. And so my question for you is when you take the wrong courses, when you study stuff that you're never gonna do, do you waste your time? Is that a waste of your time? Right now, if you're being honest with yourself, maybe this hasn't happened to you yet, but certainly it will over the next few years where you're sitting in the class and the teacher's teaching you something and in your head, you're saying, why am I learning this? Like, when am I ever gonna do this in my life? You know, because it's human nature. We don't want to waste our time. And so we, we're, we think critically about these things and that's good. You know, I took chemistry in grade 11 as an example and they taught us stoichiometry. And I thought I had to figure that stuff out and I did it. And then I never did it again for 30 years. You know, did I waste my time learning stoichiometry? And what I'm going to tell you is this. I mean, first of all, I could have used it. You know, had I gone to the University of Alberta and signed up for paleontology, perhaps I'd be balancing equations today. Maybe. But I chose a different path. I predict that you will change a different path. And that according to the stats in America, students change their major on average three times, which means you're probably going to end up having have picked the wrong courses. But here's what happens. The day you figured out stoichiometry, you became more adaptable that day. It's like your adaptability XP score went up plus two, you know? And it keeps going up every time you guys figure something out. You learn to speak a different language, roadmap an essay, take the area under a curve, solve for X, you know, plan a meal. Every time you guys learn something and you figure it out, you are becoming more adaptable because you are problem solving and you are simply learning how to learn. And that's the skill that you take with you when you graduate high school. Because then you go into college and you know, and so far you know about mechanics and you like cars. And so you got into the local college for the mechanic program and you figure out you're gonna earn 18 to $20 an hour the day you graduate. But your new buddy, Dave over there, he's in the underwater welding program and you find out he's gonna earn $1,000 a day when he graduates. And you're like, I didn't even know you could weld underwater. So now you wanna get in that program but you took all the wrong courses in high school. So what? You're gonna pick up some more courses right now, some prerequisites, and then you're gonna go down that path. And it's totally normal and it's okay because you learned how to learn in high school. <laughs> you know, 
They say you're going to do that three times anyway. And then while you're in college, you know, high school and college, the whole world's going to change on you as well, right? When I was your age, a telephone was rotary dial. You watch the first season of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, you'll see them on the phone. It's connected to the wall with a cable. You know, and everyone else in the house can listen in on the phone call. And then 10 years later, all known knowledge in the history of the world was on my phone in my pocket. And the whole world changed. And I've been working in this industry ever since. There was no course in high school I could have taken to tell me what to do. I've had to figure this stuff out. And the same thing is going to happen for you guys. You know, think about it. What is the world going to look like 10 years from now when you're done college, when today we can print body parts with 3D printers, <laughs> right? I can get a roof for my house that powers my house and makes me money. There's autonomous cars driving themselves all over the place, you know. There's a 3D, there's a company in Australia that can print a house from a 3D printer in 24 hours, one day, print a house. Um, Hyperloops exist on the planet today, which are plastic bubbles the size of a bus that carries people, you know, 700 miles per hour through a vacuum tube. I was at a conference five years ago and, I want, and this young lady gets up in the middle of the stage and she announces that she's one of four people that's been selected to colonize Mars. <laughs> Mars, you know that they got a rover up there figuring out how to turn, uh, create oxygen out of their atmosphere, right? What they're trying to do is figure out how to reduce the commute from seven months before we go build a city on Mars. That's what they're trying to solve for right now. I remember the moment I heard that lady say that she's been selected to colonize Mars. And I said, whoa, what is my kitchen going to look like in 10 years? <laughs> like, what's the postal service going to be? What's the communication world going to be when we can live and work in space, guys? You're not taking courses in high school teaching you exactly what you will be doing. You are simply learning how to learn so that you can be adaptable for this crazy, awesome, changing world. It's kind of cool, right? Now, so what's the most important thing? What is motivating you to want to learn? So here's the bit of research. Vocational identity. Remember I talked about that at the beginning? How do I see myself in the world of work? The research tells us that vocational identity is one of the best strategies to get a student engaged in school. Meaning it did not matter that I wanted to be a paleontologist and I never did it. All that mattered was I wanted to be anything at all. And that was the rope that pulled me through school so that I picked chemistry and I picked math and I picked English and I picked French. You know, even though they told me I had to take sciences, I still felt like I was picking them because I needed them to go down this path. Does that make sense to you? And when you pick your courses, when you think you need them for a reason because you want to go in that direction, your motivation level to learn what you're being taught is naturally higher. You can imagine that if you have no rope pulling you through, if you have no direction, no idea, no interest, and they make you take courses, why do you care? Why would you care? But then you miss out on this practice of learning how to learn because it's so, it feels so hard, you know? So this is one big reason that we focus on vocational identity, letting you guys explore, find out this vast universe of opportunities. There's 14,000 job titles in the United States. 14,000 different jobs, official jobs that you can do and 2,600 programs. You know that there's something out there that would be interesting. You just got to find it, right? Now, the second piece, and this is actually the real research behind career development, career planning. Why do we focus on college and career prep? And it's something called hope theory. So let's say you discover that you can get a degree in comic books. You can get a degree in craft beer making. You can get a degree in 3D game design or music therapy or addictions counseling or, 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 or. Underwater welding, you know? And something makes you excited and interested. And then you're going, yeah, man, that's pretty cool. Well, what do you do now? Well, next step is to do some detective work. You start at the end and you work back to today. At the end, you're working in that job and you're figuring out, okay, how much do they earn? And is this industry growing or shrinking? How many jobs are in my community or am I gonna to need to move to a different city or a different state to do this job, okay? And you can do that research. It's called labor market information, which takes about 20 minutes once you're on the right page. And then you figure out, okay, well now I gotta go study it. So where do I go? Is it on the job training? Do I go through the forces, the military? Do I go to college? You know, what do I do? And which college offers that program? 
And how much does it cost to get into that college? And can I live there? And do they have scholarships? What courses do I need now in high school? And what grades do I need to get in there? And you can do that detective work. And you work right back to today. And here's the beauty of this. If you've done that detective work to the point where you believe, like you know the steps, you have the information, and you believe that there is a path that you can follow to that goal of the career, guys, that is the definition of hope. And hope is the biggest predictor of your objective academic achievement. It's a better predictor of your success than your grades today. Also a bit better predictor of your success than your personality and your intelligence. Did you hear me say that bit about grades too? The reason I'm highlighting that is if you are a C or a D student, you're not a great student right now. It's okay, you can still succeed. You can still have hope. And maybe you live in a garage with your parents right now. It's okay, you can still have hope. Hope is not for wealthy people. Hope is not for smart people. Hope is for a clever person. Okay, this is what I mean by this. This is how it works. If I gave you guys some crazy meal right now from Holland that my parents might have made that you can't even recognize what is on that plate <laughs> and I ask you to go and cook me that meal, I don't think it matters how smart or how wealthy you are. You're probably not going to walk into the grocery store and guess the ingredients and make that meal. Your probability of success would be low. But a clever person will read the recipe first and then go shopping, right? And then your probability of success goes higher. And that's what we're doing when we do career development early. It's like we're looking at the recipe first. What do I need to do to get there? And then you go through these years of school. And that is the biggest predictor of your success. This is the thing you need to do on the side while you're going through school, while you're going through college. And you're gonna change your mind a dozen times, it's okay. But you will know the steps that you need to do and you will know the tools that can help you do it, okay? That makes this some of the most important work and activities that you can do in high school because it helps put everything else you're gonna do into perspective.